Welcome to the Mother Earth News and Friends podcast. Today, we're spicing things up at Mother Earth News and Friends podcast by dedicating a whole episode to learning about spicy chili peppers. Whether we can handle their heat like a champ or break out in immediate sweats, many of us can agree these peppers offer unmatched flavors and excitement for numerous dishes. Denise Kuhn, a research specialist with more than two decades of experience researching chili peppers, joins Kenny Coogan for a conversation all about these small plants that pack a powerful punch. This is Mother Earth News. Have you ever wanted to meet our podcast presenters in person or take workshops from them? You can by going to one of our many Mother Earth News fairs each year. You can take hands-on workshops, attend information-filled presentations, and shop from our many vendors specializing in DIY ideas, homesteading, and natural health. Our 2023 fair schedule includes fairs in Kansas, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Learn more about all our fairs by going to MotherEarthNewsFair.com. Use the code FAIRGUEST for $5 off at checkout. Whichever fair you choose to join us at, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Come visit your mother at the 2023 Mother Earth News Fairs. Good day, everyone, and we appreciate you for joining us on another spicy Mother Earth News and Friends podcast. I am Kenny Coogan, and joining me today is Denise Kuhn, a research specialist. At Mother Earth News for 50 years and counting, we have been dedicated to conserving our planet's natural resources while helping you conserve your financial resources. Today, we are going to learn about chili peppers. Denise Kuhn is a research specialist for the Departments of Extension Plant Sciences and Plant and Environmental Sciences at New Mexico State University. She has a master's degree in horticulture and over 20 years of experience with chili pepper research. She is also a native New Mexican with small farm roots in northern New Mexico. Welcome to the podcast, Denise. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm excited to have you because as part of the podcast team, I get to decide the guests and the topics. And when thinking of a seasonal crop profile that I wanted to cover, I immediately thought of spicy chili peppers. I love them. I put hot sauce and hot peppers on all of my meals. The first question, Denise, is, is there something wrong with people who like spicy foods? Why do people enjoy eating something that causes hiccups and heartburn or mild to severe sweating? Absolutely not. So um, I think, you know, chili peppers are so diverse and there's so many different flavor profiles that I think anyone on the planet could actually love a certain type of chili pepper. There's a huge range of heat levels, but yeah, some of the hotter stuff definitely can cause some pain. I know there's a lot of people out there that we kind of term them super tasters. They don't have a lot of the TRPV1 receptors in their mouth, so they can actually enjoy really hot chili peppers and love the flavor and not be bothered too much by the heat. But then there's other people who have a lot of those receptors and super hot stuff actually really bothers them. The other thing that chili peppers do that capsaicin, the chemical that makes chili peppers hot, does is it causes a little bit of a an endorphin surge. So so people kind of get this little release of endorphins when they eat it. And people say sometimes that chili peppers are addictive. So lots of different things that go on with our our beloved chili peppers that make them wonderful to eat and consume. And there we go. And uh, you keep saying chili peppers, and I introduced you as like a chili pepper uh, researcher. What is a chili? And what is a chili pepper? And what is a pepper? Horticulturally, anything that comes from the flower of the plant or the plant is considered a chili pepper. And that's spelled C-H-I-L-E and then, of course, P-E-P-P-E-R. So that's a chili pepper. Chili, spelled with an I, C-H-I-L-I, is the culinary dish that kind of consists of beans, usually a protein, and chili, C-H-I-L-E, powder, 
that makes this nice, wonderful, you know, chili that we, that we consume every now and then. And then peppers is kind of just a general term for all chili peppers. Um, you can have sweet peppers or you can have hot peppers and bell peppers and even sweet cherry peppers, something that doesn't have any heat. They're all cap capsicums, so they're all in the same family. Uh, it's just that sometimes people call them sweet peppers and then the hot stuff people call hot peppers. You were mentioning capsaicin. Is that the thing that makes chili peppers spicy and hot? Yeah, and the interesting thing about capsaicin is within the solanaceous family, there's tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, tobacco, and a lot of those plants have lots of different alkaloids. And some of those alkaloids are kind of toxic to humans. You can't eat like potato leaves or tomato leaves without getting like a really serious stomach ache because of some of these alkaloids. And capsaicin is the only alkaloid that chili pepper plants produce and it's still edible by humans. A really interesting thing about chili peppers. So yeah, that's the only alkaloid. It is the chemical that makes chili peppers hot. There are 25 different capsaicinoids within capsaicin that provide different types of sensations in the mouth or on the skin. And uh, it's, it's kind of complex. And where are these chemicals found inside the fruit? Because people used to say the seeds. Then people got a little showy and said, oh, it's the ribs and not the seeds. And then I think people are going back and forth. So what does the research say? For a very long time before what's termed a super hot chili or anything over 1 million Scoville heat units, that's what we term super hots. Before those kind of came onto the market and were being grown and, and produced, most chili peppers produce capsaicin glands or like these little glands that house the capsaicin oil. And they only produce them on the vein or the placenta inside the pod. And that's where the seeds are attached as well. So that's why a lot of people think the seeds are hot. They aren't. It's just that they're in really close proximity to the placental tissue. And seeds are very porous. So, you know, if you chop up a jalapeno, you're breaking some of those capsaicin glands. And that oil can seep very easily into the seeds. And so that's why a lot of people think, you know, if they're having like nachos and they have some jalapenos on those nachos and the seed, they bite into a seed and it's really hot, it's, it's because some of that capsaicin oil seeped into that seed. Now, when super hots came along, we actually discovered at New Mexico State University that not only are these particular types of chili peppers producing these capsaicin glands on the placental tissue, but they're also producing it in the walls. And that's why some of these super hot chilies are so hot. So generally for about 90% of chili peppers out there, it's produced in the placenta, but super hot chilies, which is anything over 1 million Scoville heat units, it's produced in the placenta and in the walls. Okay. So when you're talking, I just made a connection. Are you or your facility creating new heirloom peppers? So I remember seeing like seed packs that say NU Mex, like New Mex. There's like the jalapeno orange spice and the lemon spice and things like that. Uh, so anything that has the NU MEX in front of it was developed at New Mexico State University. And we currently have just over Probably, so so the, the chili breeding program at NMSU started back in the days of Fabian Garcia, who kind of invented this New Mexican chili pod type back in the early 1900s. And so that's when the breeding program began. And since then, we've had other breeders that have taken his place. And we have come up with just a little over 60 different New Mex varieties, and mainly for the New Mexico chili industry, which means they're probably a, a New Mexican red or green chili. Red and green come from the same plant, but they're, they're used differently within the industry. So we consider them different industrial uses there. We also produce jalapenos, cayennes, and paprika. So most of the varieties that NMSU has developed is in one of those realms. So yeah, anything that has the Numex in front of it is developed there. And we are always looking at breeding new varieties that are going to help our industry grow and help keep our growers and processors on the leading edge of this industry, just because 
chili peppers are such a cultural thing in New Mexico and such, you know, loved here. So we try to produce varieties that have greater yield, have disease resistance, more flavor. Those are kind of some of the things that we're focusing on. I was just going to ask you back in the 1900s, do you know why the breeding program started? Was it those things or was it they wanted something spicier or do they want bigger fruits or, you know, there's so many different categories that you could breed for? Actually, all of those things that you said. So Fabian Garcia, when he started his breeding program, was really looking at kind of the native chilies that were being grown in the Pueblo areas of New Mexico. And they were all usually very small, very hot, and had very thin walls so that they could dry down easily and be used over the winter months. But Fabian Garcia wanted something with thicker meat, bigger pods so that you'd get bigger yield and something that you could actually roast the green and use it in food that way. And so he did lots of hybridizations and really we call him the grandfather of New Mexico cuisine because it uh, he started the whole craze of of New Mexico green and red chili and and it's just really taken off since since then. Going off script because I love hot pepper so much. So when you're saying that thinking about like the thicker walls I think recently I bought some jalapenos. They had super thick walls and they were tasteless. They were not spicy. I didn't uh, seed them or get rid of the ribs or anything. I just chopped them up like I normally do. And I was so disappointed. Any ideas of what happened from the farm to my table? Absolutely. So unfortunately... When you get these pods, whether it's a New Mexican pod type, whether it's a jalapeno, and they have like really super thick walls, sometimes it's because of water content. And if you have a much higher water content in the pod, it's really going to dilute the flavors. And so that's something that we have really been focusing on at NMSU. We released a couple of new varieties about 10 years ago called our Heritage Varieties. And we really focused on not only the thicker walls, but to make sure that they had all of that traditional flavor. And we used some matte spec equipment and actually found that some of these varieties that we released had five times more flavor compounds than the previous predecessor. And so, so, you know, being able to do that, and unfortunately, I mean, in the industry, when you have higher water content, you're going to have heavier weights. And so you're going to, that's going to turn into higher yield when it's not necessarily a good thing if you have all that water in there. (laughs) Who gets to taste all of these peppers before they go to the market? I do. (laughs) I also have a very, very good student team. We have student research aides that come in and we kind of help them develop their palates for it and kind of teach them what they're supposed to be tasting. And I'm not the only one that has to do this. I have a team that helps out as well. And can we go back to the Scoville units? Historically, was it done by a person? Is it done by a machine ever? It was named Scoville Heat Units after Dr. Wilbur Scoville. He was a scientist, a chemist, and he really wanted to figure out, you know, how to really rate chili peppers with their heat levels because he was able to recognize he was a a chili lover and loved to eat chilies and recognized that there were different heat levels. And so he kind of developed this organoleptic test, which is, you know, uh, that he has a panel of taste testers out there. He would put samples in front of them and have them taste and then dilute it. And every time he would dilute it, he'd have them taste and they had to taste and then When they didn't feel the heat anymore, that was how many times it was diluted, and that was its Scoville heat unit. And so originally it was an organoleptic test, and these days we actually have a machine called um, high-performance liquid chromatography. We put the samples in the machine, it runs them through, and it has software that actually can pick out the different capsaicinoids and how much of those capsaicinoids are in it. So it's super precise. Whereas the organoleptic test is probably a little more biased with different people because different people taste differently. And so the computer program is a lot better and and actually much more accurate. And when the people were tasting it, were they tasting a like minced chili pepper or was it a liquid drop? 
Yeah, so it was probably more than likely if I remember reading through the ASTA method, if I can remember that in my head right now, I would say it was more than likely a liquid sample that had probably chili powder mixed into it at a certain concentration and then diluted from there. All right, so let's be a little bit more appetizing now. So how are chili peppers used in New Mexican cuisine? I'm assuming not all of them are blended into a pipette. Very true, yes. So the cool thing about chili peppers is they are not only part of the cultural New Mexican cuisine, but they're also used as a spice, as a, a medicinal agent, as a coloring agent, and also as a natural food additive. So in New Mexican cuisine, we use the green chili and the red chili. Green, of course, is the mature green stage of the pods, where if you leave those green pods on the plant even longer, they will turn red, and that's where we get our red chili from. Green chili is used in things like enchiladas, burritos. You know, anytime you see like a green chili, something or other on a menu, that's what that is. Red chili can actually be used, it can be dried and used as a dried spice. It can also be used, the red chili can be rehydrated and turned into red chili sauce on things like red chili enchiladas or red chili burritos, even in the chili CHLI that we were talking about earlier. And then there's the coloring. So red, super high red chili peppers, you can extract the red color from, and that's a natural red coloring agent. So lots of different uses for chili peppers. And when you're working with chili peppers, how careful do you have to be to avoid touching your eyes or other sensitive body parts? 100%. We actually have a whole training session that we put any of our research aides through. They are always required to wear personal protective equipment, which includes gloves, a dust mask, or even a respirator, depending on how hot the samples are that they're working with goggles for your eyes. And if they're doing anything where there's a lot of air movement, they actually have to wear a full hazmat suit. <laughs> so it's just to keep everyone safe. I know over the 25 years I've been working with chili peppers, I've definitely gotten it in my eyes, gotten it on my skin and not had a fun time. So it's part of the, it's a job hazard. It's part of the job and you think you get used to it, but you never do. <laughs> When I bought a hot sauce, maybe a year or two ago, I had to sign a paper, like a waiver saying that I wasn't going to give it to anyone unwillingly. So what about the chef or the cook in the kitchen? And they buy like super spicy peppers or chili peppers. What should they do to like their equipment? Or I'm assuming they should be wearing gloves. Is there any other like PPE items that, that we should be thinking about? Absolutely. If, if, if you're cooking with something that's really hot, you definitely want to take precautions. If you're deseeding something or getting inside the pod, especially with super hot chilies, you want to wear gloves. Um, even with some of the jalapenos and New Mexican type chilies, they're hot enough to actually make your hands very uncomfortable for a while. You know, the capsaicin binds to that TRPV1 receptor. And really the only thing known to break that binding site is the casein in dairy products. So, you know, if you have, you know, exposed sensitive parts of your skin, you know, something like cold ice cream or cold yogurt or cold milk will help kind of alleviate some of that and help break those binding sites. But yeah, that's really the only thing that, that'll help. And, and yeah, if you're cooking with it, you definitely want to take precautions. I remember um, a city or a town that had like a sriracha factory and they were complaining because of burning nasal passages, running, eyes watering, and maybe akin to this, my neighbor once made homemade horseradish. The inside of the house was kind of like a bomb, you know, the spice. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like pepper spray goes off in an enclosed <laughs> area. And, and yeah, that happens all the time, especially if we're um, saving seed from stuff, some of the equipment that we have really pushes that stuff up into the air and you, you have to be very careful. It's like you, you know, you end up pepper spraying yourself and it's, it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> In a 2002 episode of Alias, 
coal torture Sloan by injecting a super concentrated derivative of capsaicin through what looks like acupuncture needles. And he was like putting them like in his hands. And I, I you know, love spicy food. So I was like probably eating nachos was when I was watching this thinking like, oh, this is one of like the worst forms of torture ever. But then today I was reading that when capsaicin is given in high doses, it relieves pain and not causes it and that it is in a common ingredient in many topical pain relieving ointments. So what do you think about that? And should we be contacting JJ Abrams and changing the show from 21 years ago? So yeah, absolutely. I mean, if capsaicin is used medicinally and put into a carrier that isn't going to, you know, get into your eyes or up your nose or something like that. You know, if it's in a topical cream, it absolutely has been proven to show that it helps things, especially like arthritis or sore muscles, because the same receptors that are pain receptors, uh, the TRPV1 that recognize the capsaicin and recognize it from chili peppers, are the same pain receptors for other types of pain. So if you're taking the capsaicin and putting it on your skin, it's going to feel it's going to feel like like pain and your body will release endorphins to help fight that pain. And so I think that's probably the main thing that happens with a lot of these topical creams, arthritis creams, muscle aching creams that have the capsaicin in them is it's essentially a you're putting a little pain with the capsaicin to combat a bigger pain and it, and it it definitely has been proven to be effective. Do you know if these products are advertising that they have capsaicin in it, or is it like a hidden secret? No, they absolutely do. So a lot of them, you know, next time you have a, a, you know, you work out too hard and your muscles are killing you, you know, and you decide, well, I'm going to get some muscle cream, take a look at the ingredients. And I would be willing to bet that 90% of the time there's capsaicin in there. I don't know if you can, but can you summarize what you do as a chili pepper researcher like over the course of like maybe a year, because I'm assuming that there's seasons to your job. So we have four major seasons in Southern New Mexico. We have a winter, spring, summer, and fall. And chili peppers cannot tolerate freezing. So we definitely have a season that where we can grow outside. Well, since we're in spring, I'll start with spring. We are actually extremely busy right now planting, transplanting into the fields, and we'll probably do that for a couple more weeks and get everything in the field. Then we have like a little bit of a lull, and then things really start to grow. Then as a breeder, you want to start going through your field and looking for things that you've planted and making selections for certain characteristics, whether it's high yield, disease resistance, flavor, color. You know, you're going to be doing that probably um, most of the summer. And then late summer into early fall, you're going to start harvesting. And that's where it's really fun in New Mexico. We have the Hatch Chili Festival. We have lots of festivals that kind of revolve around chili peppers because the green harvest is happening. We're roasting green chili. After the green harvest, we're doing red. And just, you know, a lot of the um, New Mexican cuisine restaurants are, have nice fresh chili and, and people flock here to get their fix. Then we kind of move into winter, and that's when we're doing all of our seed extraction, probably DNA extraction, all those things in the lab where it's kind of too cold to do anything outside. Then say January, February, we kind of start up the next season again, and we go through everything that we've got and sit down and, and figure out, you know, what we're going to do with last year's stuff and what we're going to move forward and any new projects and then get started all over again in spring. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. In your department or unit or even the university, do you have an idea of how many chili pepper plants you put in the ground every year? So just off the top of my head, we just transplanted some of the research plots over the last two weeks. And if I had to kind of do a best educated guess, I'd say we probably put about 2,000 plants in the ground. And over the 20 years of experience with chili pepper research, can you give us like one or two kind of like discoveries like that you personally found interesting or that maybe made news that you, you know, were really excited about? 
So I was part of a team that discovered the first super hot chili pepper. It was the ghost pepper or the boot jalokia. Uh, we had been sent some seeds from one of our colleagues in Assam, India, and we spent probably about four or five years doing replicated trials on these, comparing them to some other chili peppers that we knew were really hot, and finally did discover that it was the first chili pepper that was over 1 million Scoville heat units. So I was on the team that did that. And then I was also the individual that discovered that the super hots created the capsaicin vesicles on the walls, and uh, not only on the placenta, but on the walls. I kind of came by that by accident. I was on camera for the History Channel. They were recording a segment on super hot chilies, and it was late in the afternoon. We had gone through a, a really rigorous day of filming, and I had some of the scorpion peppers in my hand. And it was a hot day because it's really hot here in the summertime. So my hands were probably sweating. My face was sweating. I hadn't opened these pods. They were still closed. Um, they hadn't been cut open or anything like that. Ended up, I hadn't touched any other chili peppers. I ended up like wiping some of the sweat off my face and my face just exploded on fire. And it's because these super hots, you know, it can seep out of the walls. <laughs> and so I was handling them and realized, I said, this is really strange. This shouldn't have happened. So I kind of cut open these pods and started looking at them and kind of seeing some interesting things on the walls. And so we actually put them under electron microscopes and found the capsaicin glands on the walls. So that was a really cool discovery, really interesting. And, and it, was, it was a lot of fun to publish it. Do you think the best discoveries are from serendipity? <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break in our conversation to hear a word from our sponsor. And when we return, we will learn all about growing chili peppers. Have you ever wanted to meet our podcast presenters in person or take workshops from them? You can by going to one of our many Mother Earth News fairs each year. You can take hands-on workshops, attend information-filled presentations, and shop from our many vendors specializing in DIY ideas, homesteading, and natural health. Our 2023 fair schedule includes fairs in Kansas, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Learn more about all our fairs by going to MotherEarthNewsFair.com. Use the code FAIRGUEST for $5 off at checkout. Whichever fair you choose to join us at, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Come visit your mother at the 2023 Mother Earth News Fairs. We are back with Denise Kuhn, a research specialist at New Mexico State University. So Denise, is there any research being done for sustainable chili pepper growing? Because I have a master's in global sustainability and we always are talking about the triple bottom line where we need to balance people, profit, and the planet. I think chili peppers are my favorite food item. So we got to make sure they're sustainable. So is there any research being done on that front? Absolutely. Um, I actually just recently switched under Dr. Stephanie Walker, who is the extension vegetable specialist at New Mexico State University. And she, her whole program is kind of focuses on sustainability. We have several different research plots. Some of the things that we've implemented in our plots over the last couple of years are things like biodegradable mulch, you know, growing organically, doing things like solarization to help the soil and to kill weed seeds, you know, anything that's biodegradable, whether it's biodegradable trellising or not using pesticides, you know, all of that stuff, just really with a focus on sustainability is what we, we really try to do in this program. Dr. Walker was actually developed a machine harvestable green chili. For a long time, only the red chili varieties and jalapenos were able to be machine harvested. And she developed a green chili variety that is now machine harvestable. And Lots of our growers and producers are using it and being able to harvest a little more efficiently and more sustainable. And so, so yeah, lots and lots of sustainability issues and, and moving forward with, with that focus. Can you attempt to describe what the machine looks like that is picking these peppers? So I want to say the Chili Pepper Institute probably has some video of it on their website at somewhere, maybe in their Facebook feed. 
essentially the one that we've been using is a single row harvester and it has kind of like if you imagine a DNA helix that goes down and kind of goes to the base of the stem of the plant and then just kind of comes up. And as the DNA helix looking, I think for lack of a better term, fingers kind of come up and just pull all those chili peppers off the plant. And we actually watched a larger machine do it on the Numex Odyssey last fall. And it was beautiful and amazing. And the plant stayed upright and alive in the field and it harvested every single pot off the plant. So it was really beautiful to see and really exciting for the future of the chili industry. For those who want to grow chili peppers at home, what temperature do most chili peppers like to germinate in? I like things a little bit warmer. So anywhere between 80 and 90 degrees. And so if you're starting them indoors, it's, it's really good to have some bottom heat or some propagation mats that you can put your seedlings, you can start your seedlings on and keep that temperature between 80 and 90 degrees. I know this year in particular, we had kind of a colder season in the spring and we direct seeded some chili almost two months ago. And generally it takes about 14 days, anywhere between 14 and 20 days for a chili pepper seed to germinate. Because we had some really cold nights and some cold snaps during the day and it was just a little cooler in general, it took our direct seeded chilies almost five weeks to actually germinate, which is kind of crazy, but they are, they're up and they're growing and things are looking good. And for like the backyard grower, what type of soil conditions do they prefer? Anything that's probably high in organic matter and well-drained. Chili pepper plants do not like to be soggy. If the soil is soggy a lot, they, you'll get root rot really, really quickly. So um, something with high organic matter that's a little more sandy that has, that's really well draining so that there, you can go from, from moist to a little bit, not completely drying out because you, you don't want to do that either, but just never sitting in water or never being super soggy. And can you tell me from seed to fruit, how long should we expect to wait for? And I ask that because I'm assuming cultivated varieties, cultivars, and maybe species are going to affect how long you have to wait. So anything within the anum species, which is our jalapenos, bell peppers, sweet peppers, um, New Mexican types, cayenne, things like that in, within the anum, it's anywhere between 120 and 130 days from seed to start fruiting. Chinenses, like your super hots and your habaneros, those are going to take a little bit longer. They come from more temperate zones or tropical areas. And so they really require nice, warm, humid conditions. And so they actually take anywhere between 130 and 150 days. Aside from the longevity, is there a difference between annual and biannual chili peppers? I'm assuming there's like spicy and mild annuals and spicy and mild biannuals or perennials? Are they called biannuals or perennials? So chili peppers are considered annuals anywhere where it, we have freezing temperatures because they can't handle the freezing temperatures. So places like Southern Arizona, Southern California, Florida, South Texas, where you don't really get freezing temperatures, they're actually considered perennials. We have actually in the chili breeding programs, greenhouse, we have a capsicum galapagoense and it's native to the Galapagos Islands. We have a plant in there that's actually 12 years old and it still produces pods and still goes through its phases and has super woody stems, almost like a tree. It's amazing. So yeah, as long as they are subject to freezing temperatures, they're considered perennials. Do you know if there's like a really expensive Peruvian pepper? Have you heard of that? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff hitting the markets these days because, you know, chili peppers just take off. And when there's something new, people are always interested. So lots of the, the, the bacatums, it's actually capsicum bacatum that's really grown in South America and a lot of the Latin countries. And there's some really interesting varieties and different um, heat sensations, different flavors. So if someone can get some good marketing going on, they can always do something good with, with new varieties. And for the backyard grower, and I'm sure you also experience this, 
what are some common pests and diseases that we should be looking out for? Unfortunately, nothing is immune from pests and diseases. If you're a backyard gardener, aphids love chili peppers, but aphids are probably the easiest thing to get rid of. So aphids, there's also leafhoppers, and unfortunately, leafhoppers carry a virus called the beet curly top virus, and it can actually be really devastating to growers. The chili pepper isn't the leafhopper's main food source, but they're attracted to color, and for some reason, their main food source is the same color as a lot of chili pepper varieties. And so they'll go and feed on it, but the minute they feed on it, they've already injected the virus. So then they realize, oh, that's not my normal food source, and they go on to something else, but they've already injected the virus. So beet curly top is a big one. We also have fungal pathogen called Phytophthora here in New Mexico. It was actually discovered here in New Mexico for the first time. It's a waterborne pathogen. We do have kind of what we call a monsoon season in the late summer, early fall around here. And if we get sitting water in the fields, it can be really devastating because it kind of moves fungal spores around and infects chili and is really devastating as well. But those are kind of the main things, you know, bacterial spot. I know that birds and rabbits love to eat chili peppers um, because they don't they don't have any of the alkaloids or toxins in their leaves, so they're super yummy and deer as well. So you got to think about all those things if you're uh, if you're growing them in, a, in your backyard. If you have deer, squirrels, rabbits, birds, that they're all going to be happy eating chili peppers. And after we get through all of that, and you produce your peppers, your chili peppers, what is your favorite way to consume them or incorporate them into a meal? I really, really love New Mexican cuisine just because I was born and raised here. I grew up on it. So I think probably enchiladas with both red and green chili are probably my favorite dish. And then something that I really, really love to do at home is I have my own garden, of course, and I grow lots of jalapenos and serranos. And I love to make fresh salsa with tomatoes, jalapenos, and serranos in the summertime. Do you ever can that salsa or it's always fresh? always fresh. So I did kind of experiment with fermentation last summer and, and made my own hot sauces. I, I still prefer some of the, the ones off the store shelf because I'm, I'm a budding fermenter, but it was, it was a lot of fun and a learning experience. Thank you so much, Denise, for speaking with us today. Our conversation on chili peppers has been very enlightening. I was very happy to chat with you. Wonderful. We thank you, the listener, for joining our podcast and encourage you to share it with your friends, colleagues, and family. To listen to more podcasts and to learn more, visit our website, MotherEarthNews.com. You can also follow our social media platforms from that link to ask questions about future topics. And remember, no matter how brown your thumb is, you can always cultivate kindness. You've just heard our episode with Denise Kuhn about spicy chili peppers. You can reach us at letters at MotherEarthNews.com with any comments or suggestions. Our podcast production team includes Jessica Mitchell, John Moore, and Kenny Coogan. Music for this episode is Travel Light by Jason Shaw. This Mother Earth News and Friends podcast is a production of Ogden Publications. Learn more about us at MotherEarthNews.com. Have you ever wanted to meet our podcast presenters in person or take workshops from them? You can by going to one of our many Mother Earth News fairs each year. You can take hands-on workshops, attend information-filled presentations, and shop from our many vendors specializing in DIY ideas, homesteading, and natural health. Our 2023 fair schedule includes fairs in Kansas, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Learn more about all our fairs by going to MotherEarthNewsFair.com. Use the code FAIRGUEST for $5 off at checkout. Whichever fair you choose to join us at, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Come visit your mother at the 2023 Mother Earth News Fairs. Until next time, don't forget to love your mother. <laughs>